Blunt. You're listening to Organically Blunt, the cannabis lifestyle podcast that's raw, uncut, and unedited. Please enjoy the show. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Organically Blunt. I am Jay Blaze, your host. And this morning, we have the opportunity to talk to somebody that grows cannabis clear on the other side of the world. Welcome to the show, Potent Ponics, and it is a pleasure to have you here checking in from Thailand. Thanks for having me. It's fun to Definitely. come on uh, the new show and uh, I recently found out about your stuff and listening to it lately in the greenhouse, so th thanks for having me on. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, we're a little bit newer. We've been around just over a year now, and um, we've had a lot of great guests. Now we get the opportunity to kind of jump over the pond and see how you guys do things over there. So, you know, I want to kind of start this out simple. And the question I want to introduce everybody to is kind of how you got into cannabis and where where you're at now and some of the places you might have grown just kind of give us a i guess you'd say a ball of wax here of of your experience and and kind of how you got started with the plant sure so um for those of you who don't know uh i'm steve from potent ponics i founded the company uh, originally back when i worked with um, sylvia uh, at the aquaponic source uh, but i've been working at uh, in the cannabis industry for a long time. Um, I <laughs> just got started back on the East Coast, um, you know, working in the pet trade. A lot of pet stores had back rooms or basements or whatever else where they were growing. Uh, so kind of got got started at that at a younger age. I think a lot of other people at, at a bigger scale than, than most other people on the East Coast, that's for sure. Definitely. Uh, and then from there, ended up uh, moving out West um, later on in 2010 and then working in the Colorado market as that started to come online and, uh, and become legalized. So that was a lot of fun. And then Definitely. after that, uh, uh, we had the floods happen in, in Colorado, uh, and I lost my job where I was working at through the floods and then ended up getting a job at the aquaponics source, uh, and then heading up their product and development in, uh, and working in their lab and, um, heading up the cannabis program there for a couple of years. And then when they sold to a new, a new owners, um, they didn't want to be involved with cannabis anymore. And then I started my own company. Um, so that was, uh, I guess, the, the, the very short version of, of how I got started. And then Definitely. as far as places I've grown, uh, I've grown in Jamaica, I've grown in Zimbabwe, South Africa, Canada, all across the United States, a whole bunch of different places in the United States. Uh, I'm currently in Thailand. Um, so I'll be, uh, you know, all over the place when it comes to different types of environments and each one kind of had its own challenges, um, supplying, uh, getting, you know, a lot of these different supplies has been, um, tricky, especially in Zimbabwe. And then in the beginning here in Thailand, but now that's getting a lot easier now that the market's gotten a little bit larger. So definitely, definitely. Now I just got a question out of curiosity. You just sparked my curiosity. So you've been to all these beautiful countries. You've learned to, have to adapt to different environments and growing atmospheres. How hard is it <laughs> to adapt to all these language changes? I mean, that's got to be a, a challenge, ain't it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would say Thai is probably the hardest so far. Um, Shona in Africa is, because it was a, colonized by the British, um, is very easy to, to pronounce phonetically like so it, it sounds pretty wacky but if you actually just look at the spelling and you pronounce it using like english or a little bit of spanish or or, or other latin background you can kind of stumble your way through it and at least get enough close enough to where they could figure out what you're trying to say right but in in uh, thai here it's it's quite a bit of a jump so it's more like memorization than it is trying to understand it, at least where I'm at right now. But usually you kind of start off with the basic words and the stuff that you have to talk to all the time and then work out from there. It's usually a lot easier to go that route. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, like Rusty said in the chat, he said anything that uses a different alphabet kind of sucks. <laughs> yeah, and Thai, you have like letters that are only used in writing that are not used in wow. <laughs> verbal. So there's like part of the alphabet that is like, you know, basically not used for half of the purpose of language, which is just weird. 
That is weird, definitely. So I I was doing a little bit of reading. You know, I, I'm on the road a lot, so I don't get a chance to read a lot. I get a lot, lot more opportunity to listen. And um, some of the stuff I realized is you guys haven't been – is is it considered legal? Because from what I was reading from over there, it was considered what they call decriminalized. Yeah, so basically they <laughs> – it's kind of in a weird middle ground right now. So they haven't passed the new cannabis act. I, I won't bore you with a bunch of political. Right. Political. Right. Basically they're like uh, an equivalent to like filibustering in, in the United States and the government where they like basically are just refusing to read the bill so that they don't have to vote on it because there's an election coming up and they don't want to be for or against cannabis going into the election. They just want to get through that. And then they can have an opinion. You know what I mean? So the same kind of shit they do in the States. Definitely, it's a different, definitely. Different structure. So that, it, it that's did. what's going on with that. But but right now there's a full legal structure. I mean, we have a license to operate here um, for our facility. We have a dispensary license, all that. They have a new um, registration system they put in, put in, in place on the 19th as far as keeping track of starting in March. We have to keep track of customers and ask for formal ID um, just to ensure that they're not. Uh, under 20 years old and that, um, you know, we keep a record of it for the state. So that's something, but it's, you know, it's funny seeing people moan and groan about like literally the most basic level of track and trace, like nothing like that you couldn't handle in an Excel spreadsheet and people just like losing their minds. And it's like, you understand what we have to go through in the United States? Like, this is nothing like wait till they actually want to tax you. Like, so we have right. no taxes right now. That, that's the biggest thing. We're the only legal market in the, in the world that I'm aware of that's untaxed. That's about to change, but you're right. That's the current, uh, well, of land. Yeah. well, pad that bank account while you can. That's what I say. <laughs> yeah, De definitely. You know, you know, cause they're going to, uh, uncle Sam's going to come and want his cut. Definitely. Just like he does here. Um, so, you know, I've got so many questions. I don't even know where to begin. I guess, you know, I was reading that you guys as government or whatever, we gave out a million seeds and a million plants to, to the public. That, that just yeah. blows my mind. Wow. You know, you're never going to see that over here. <laughs> that was so, so it's kind of deceiving. So the government basically like seized a bunch of low quality weed and then had all this seed sitting in a warehouse and then just like germinated it all and then gave it all out. So like a lot of it was low quality Lao and low quality Cambodian stuff and like nothing you'd really want to hold on to. Um, okay. It was just like a weird, it was more of a publicity stunt than it was like actually helping people, I guess. And they were trying, but you know, they didn't quite understand the intricacies of the whole thing. Right, and you, you see that all the time now too. I mean, I, the other day in Bury Rom, my buddy sent me a picture. Of this guy is driving around the pickup truck with plants for sale, and a bunch of them are males with open pollen, just open pollinating the neighborhood. Like, wow, <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's definitely, uh, yeah, like Rusty said, it was a gesture, <laughs> definitely. Uh, so what has been some of the biggest challenges for you personally growing there? I mean, is, is it hard to control your environment? Is the humidity higher? Is it lower, high temperatures, a lot of rain? I mean, for a lot of people that don't know, what is it like for you? Sure. So uh, as far as um, environment, you know, it's, it's much more humid. You know, we have a fog basically every morning. Um, so you got to be, you know, used to dealing with more heavier biocontrols and also just keeping heavy fungal biodiversity in your root system helps to keep those plants strong and healthy. Like we haven't had a single mold problem, but we're also applying liquid IMO every three, three waterings. So, or IPMO and one, well, either way. So we're, we're adding those fungal inoculants, you know, every third watering to, to kind of keep those plants fully boosted. Um, other than that, um, the, the, if you don't have a good facility and good biocontrols um, and good uh, biosecurity, you're, you're going to have bug problems. I, I would say that there's my grow, the grow up the street. These kids have, have gotten to know pretty well re that are local. Uh, and then one other grow out in, uh, in Burry Run, the only ones that I've, I've seen that 
didn't have spider mites, didn't have white flies, didn't have uh, broad mites that, you know, didn't have some major issue that they were either were unaware of or were totally unaware of the seriousness of the, the, the situation. And that, that seems to be like the biggest thing is a lot of these guys are just have no idea how to run a grow without any insects in there. And, you know, even, even here where we're using lots of biocontrols, we still end up with a random cricket that sneaks through the, the screen somehow, or, you know, a random little moth or butterfly that sneaks in there and lays eggs and, oh, there's a two leaves that got eaten off the plant in there. But you have to be watched. You can't just, so like in the States, you can just grab and squeeze that caterpillar. They got ones that sting you here that hurt oh, for days. Like you, you gotta, and millipedes, those can also like uh, poison you and you can be like severely, severely like made super, super sick from those millipedes. So that's something else you have to watch out for. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff. And then the snakes. That's the other one. We have lots of snakes. Like I, I like snakes, but we have over forty different species of venomous snakes here uh, in Thailand and in our valley. We have over, uh, th I think it's like eighteen or twenty. Wow. Yeah, I'm not a snake person. I unfortunately am. I'll admit it. I'm a little girl when it comes to insects and all that. I, I use beneficial bugs definitely, but anything outside yeah. of that, you ain't getting. You get beetles that are. We get huge beetles all the time and all kinds of like stuff I've never seen before that uh, is always interesting. But, you know, just learn, learning how, how to categorize, okay, it's in this genus. Um, it's a beetle of, you know, this family. Okay, well, these this type of biocontrol, this very Bassiana or Metarhizium or whatever seems to work well on it or we fall back to IPMO, you know, that wipes out a lot of stuff too. So creating our own biocontrols is another thing that we've been working on. Definitely. Rusty wants to know when he can see some legit Thai land, land race beans from plants that have been selected by you. Well, the electrical, they should start finishing that up here. Uh, in the next three to five days, the, those rooms will start to come online. Uh, and then it'll, it'll take us a while, but we've just been finishing up construction on a lot yeah. of the, uh, you know, all of our flowering spaces they're just putting the screens on the greenhouses right now um then the electrical has to get finished then we can put in the sunscreens and then we can put in the the, the beds and then, and then you know so about three weeks away from on the flowering side and then on the on the indoor for the nursery a week or two away from being able to start busting those out and, and getting that all put together quickly so so definitely you know, right after that, yeah yeah, we have a really good coffee line. We have three really good chocolate lines on the tie. We have this giant temple tie, which are these monster plants, which I have a bunch of really good ones. And we have um, so by the an agalod, which is this like really bizarre, um, a smooth edged leaf. So it has no ripples or teeth on the edge of the leaves. It's, it's perfectly smooth. So it's this weird like pointed you know, triangle shaped leaves that have no wow. serration on them. It's very bizarre. So we have lots of really cool Thai stuff. And then the, 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 um, squirrel tail Chiang Mai, we have some squirrel tail Chiang Mai's that have leaves like the size of my chest. They're just Holy massive God. and they're only like three feet tall. <laughs> they're just massive plants. Yeah. I just, I, I'm growing some Bubba cheesecake right now from seedsman. You know, they, it was a newer strain they came out with. And, um, I was flabbergasted at the size of the leaves just inside my indoor tent here. I mean, they were bigger than my head. I couldn't imagine leaves as big as my chest. That's insane. Wow. Definitely. Definitely. So, you know, what, you know, you got a lot of different cool stuff going on. You, you're, you're growing, you're building. Do you plan on keeping your roots there for a long time or do you plan on, you know, developing something and then going to another country, or do you think you're going to be there for a while? Well, for now, I'm just kind of want to hang out and enjoy the time in Thailand and you definitely know, spend a year here, see how things go, and you know, either stay here for you know till it doesn't make sense to stay here anymore, or or whatever. Yep. So definitely, definitely, don't really have a don't really have a reason to move on, and it's also going to be a big market for a while. You know, I don't see a lot of Southeast Asia legalizing in a hurry. So you're going to have a ton of tourists coming here from all over Southeast Asia and, and, you know, greater Asia just to 
come see what it's all about. You know what I mean? Definitely, definitely. I, I feel that, you know, when I was reading an article the other day, I feel that cannabis tourism is definitely on the rise. You know, it's going to be a, definitely a leading market that kind of works hand in hand. You know, you're going to start seeing, we're already starting to see a few here, what we call bud and breakfasts. And it's kind of like an Airbnb and um, you can go and stay there and it's cannabis friendly and you wake up or you get there and they even give you a little bit of smoke or a pre-roll or something like that. And it's pretty cool, you know, how the market is definitely dictating a lot of other markets. So, you know, um, so when, when was the first time you came across smoking or consuming ca cannabis and where did you find it at? Huh, that's an interesting question. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, I remember the first, I don't remember the first time I smoked, but I remember the first time I got really blitzed. Um, <laughs> was, there used to be a train station in, in Hatboro, in Pennsylvania, where I used to grow up. And you could sit there and smoke a bowl and you could look and see, first off, you could count the number of cop cars in the parking lot because you could see it from like the angle where it was. So you could see if there was any out on patrol. And if there wasn't any, then you could see if one of them left and then you could be out, you know, so you could sit there and smoke and, you know, not really have to worry about, you know, getting fucked with. And um, I remember smoking and getting super high from there. And then, uh, like a, two weeks later, finally getting some hash and some weed and then smoking and like not being able to like get up off the floor and being like so high that you couldn't really do me and my body just being like, what did we just smoke? Like was something in there and like not understanding like that whole thing. But I don't, you know, at this point I've smoked so much weed. I don't really remember too much from, from the early days. I, you know, I remember plant the first year of growing smoking. I remember getting some seeds and be like, "Well, fuck!" Like I grow a garden all the time. My grandparents like we can totally grow these, so we planted them in the back. There was this old, um, was this place called the Battle of Crooked Billet back in Pennsylvania. It was right near where I used to grow up, and uh, they had like an old Civil War cemetery or not Civil War Revolutionary War cemetery that like no one was maintaining anymore. You know, it was just long since been abandoned and uh we just planted our plants right in the back corner of the, the, the cemetery <laughs> and then one of the other neighborhood kids must have ripped the you know found it out right before harvest and anyway someone came in and ripped them all uh, wow. right before harvest. So that that sucked and then the second time we found a much better hiding spot and, and got our grow off the next year but definitely you know i was just thinking the other day you know that that sparked I thought, you know, I was driving past a big cemetery in the middle of nowhere on one of my routes and I'm looking over and I'm like, I wonder if anybody's ever thought to grow on like the back edge property of a cemetery. I'm like, you go there, people think you're visiting your relative and you just walk through and nobody's around, and take care of your plant and leave, you know, and I, but, you know, that was days past, obviously, but I grew up doing the same thing. So it was like, I'm always looking around like, what if, you know, what if somebody grew there? Like, definitely. <laughs> yeah, I had one time I was with my, my girlfriend and her friend one time and we were doing like a, like a nude shoot in the, in this old, old cemetery at like two o'clock in the morning. And the care, someone must've seen us and called the caretaker of the property. He comes out and guys totally re ready to like, shoot whoever's knocking gravestones over and it's like two girls naked and a guy with a camera and it was like not what he was expecting it was hilarious the guy was totally he was prepared for a lot he was not prepared for that right <laughs> he was totally dumbfounded confused as to what was going on <laughs> man definitely so you know that leads me to a second question that i tend to ask everybody and you know once you're high and feeling good everybody's got to go to munchie but I want to hear some of the foods that you've experienced. You know, you've had to try so many different cultural foods. What is something that you enjoy that is just like bizarre? You know, that's what I want to hear about. Something that you wouldn't bizarre. hear about here. Yeah, something different, you know, something something like that isn't seen. Or, you know, what is something you, you enjoy? Yeah, exactly. You got it. Um 
we had a, I, so as far as stuff here in Thailand, the silkworms, those are really good. I would totally throw them on pasta, like on a regular basis or in a salad. They're like <laughs> nutty and I don't know, they taste good. They, they, okay. I would totally eat those on a regular basis in the States. Um, mm. And then uh, the rice rat, they have rice rats here, which are these big giant like rabbit size um, uh, rice rats that, that they just eat the rice, they live in the rice fields. They're very clean. They, they live in the water. They wash themselves all the time and stuff like that. So they're not like a dirty rat, like a street, like a, like a Norway rat would be. Uh, and they eat those and those are, those are pretty pricey in the, in the market. So that's, it's probably up there on the stranger side of stuff for here. Um, I mean, it, in Africa, I mean, you can pretty much get whatever, I mean, you can get kudu and impala or warthog or lion or whatever. Um, wow. You know, all those things are at the market if you look hard enough. Definitely. Now, what is your normal go-to munchie? Let me ask that one too, because I'm sure you have something you enjoy to munch on. Oh yeah, here in Thailand would be uh, uh, what do they call it? What's the Thai word? Uh, anoina. Uh, but uh, in Spanish, it would be uh, uh, anona, and then in uh, Jamaican, it would be sweet sap. Um, so, and then the American, I think it's custard apple. I think is okay. the name of it those are amazing those are super super fire i can yeah. eat those every day for breakfast and be happy that's that's definitely different you know and it's probably pretty healthy i would think you know especially being custard based i mean i'm sure it's probably got sugar and stuff in it but i'm sure it's more on the healthier side of things oh yeah it's got a lot of anti-cancer stuff in it and they make the soursop which is the cousin from it they make anti-cancer drugs and stuff like that from so it's it's medicinal and good for you and high in vitamin C and uh, just tastes amazing. Definitely. So what are some of the strange you're smoking on right now? I mean, or, or I have right now on my dad. I have a Jack Career, old Jack Career cut I just got given from another dude that was visiting us from Pattaya. And then uh, what else was the other one? Banana. Banana something is in this one. And then I have gas cakes, uh, Falcon 9, I have uh, gas face, I have Wi Fi, I have blueberry OG. So I have, so, oh, we have like a CBD one to one that smells, but well, it's uh, supposed to be ACDC, but it smells like a Reese's chocolate peanut butter cup it's it's pretty bomb man that would be so. amazing definitely yeah you got quite a variety definitely you know i i got some jack going myself i mean i mean it's probably nothing close to the original but definitely you know it's fun to, the nostalgic of it to, to be able to grow it is just fun definitely and, um so what is the weirdest or the most riskiest place you've ever partaked in Oh, that's an interesting one. I'd have to think on that one for a minute. <laughs> Definitely. Um, also, I have to think about where I'm willing to do it and admit that I did it there. Right, right. Uh, Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, I've smoked. Oh, I should be careful. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. We'll try there, there's, uh, there's definitely some interesting places that had ludicrous levels of security that we yeah. managed to get get weed into and <laughs> smoke at. That's much a problem. In fact, one of them we ended up smoking with a security guard who I thought for sure was about ready to like either arrest me or immediately escort me out of the building, and he ended up being super chill. So <laughs> that's awesome. Definitely, yeah, yeah. He's, uh, I think one of the cooler ones, I used to have the keys. I used to do a lot of the, the fish tanks, maintenance of fish tanks for a lot of the keys, of uh, the offices in downtown Philadelphia. And they have wow. a maintenance tunnel that's underneath the building. So like if you're like a worker and you have to come like work on something in the building as like a, a you know, staff member as a service worker, they have sure. separate elevators for you and all that stuff. So I used to have keys to all that. So I, uh, you know, if I meet some some cool person or, or usually a cool chick on in Philly down on a Saturday night, be like, you want to go to the top of that building and go smoke a joint, and then t you know take them up there and just throw the security guy a couple bucks to you know leave you alone. Dude, that's awesome! Hell yeah! 
Yeah. Uh, no, I take it back. I, I smoked weed. I, I, this one, I think, is probably one that's fine. But it, no, it, it wasn't. It was a big deal then, but it isn't now. But um, on the steps of the uh, Congress and, and then directly in front of the White House, that was wow. really cool. And this that was be- during the uh, rally to restore stance. Uh, Rally to restore sanity and or fear that John Stewart and Stephen Colbert did, and they the police were completely overwhelmed. So we just like broke out bag our bag of weed and we're just like smoking in public, and there was like nothing they could do about it. It was great. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, man, that reminds me of a buddy of mine. You know, they had they had a rally in a different state, and he's he's a musician, he's a rapper, and he literally has a a Philly blunt. Uh, full, full, you know, it's not tobacco, it's full of cannabis, and he's got it in his mouth, and he's walking up to the line of security guards that have the shields and the batons or whatever you want to call them in, in, in his town, and uh, he's just sitting there smoking, and they, they couldn't do anything, and I'm like, man, to be able to stand your ground like that, it's got to be impressive, you know, definitely. Yeah. In Zimbabwe, I was one of the only people that could legally possess weed because of our license. So, like, we could roll through like checkpoints, like, and stuff like that. With, like, they have pretty hardcore police checkpoints there in Africa, and I'd just be like, "Cool, give me all the weed. It's fine. I have my license. Like, can't do anything. Like, it's always funny when they really pull you over to pick on you, and it's just like, cool. Here's my permit. You know, fuck off. Right, man." That's the way to go, though, you know, and a lot less heartache, like they say, you know. I, I, used, to, I used to hustle a lot back in the day. I mean, used to, definitely. Well, yeah, I think we all did. Used to, yeah. yeah. Hustle quite a bit. So, you know, outside of that, is there anything we should know about you or or your your company or what's to come in the next couple months? I'm just gonna be doing a lot of content on on from here in Thailand, kind of the full deployment of this whole uh, gigantic Rube Goldberg machine that we've built here. Um, you know, all the new breeding rooms, all the different genetics that'll be coming out of there. Uh, a lot of Thai back crosses. Uh, you know, try to preserve some of the stuff like that, the coffee and the and the chocolates. And uh, and then other than that, just just kind of showing uh, how, how that works, and then also just a probably one of the largest scale aquaponics facilities. It's certainly in, it's been set up in this part of the world, um, you know, lettuce or otherwise, uh, because of the scale that we're, we're doing with the, with the pond system here and everything. So it's pretty neat. Definitely. Definitely. Now the final question I typically ask people, you know, before we wrap everything up here, you know, is if you could smoke with anybody dead or alive, who would it be and why? Uh Probably, uh, <laughs> I want to probably Genghis Khan. That dude, I, I got to see so many different cultures, probably more than anybody else. Um, and then also, like, he defeated so many people, like, more than any, like, he defeated more generals than any other general. So, like, Clearly, the guy was a genius. You know what I mean when it comes to military mind and stuff. And then, like medicine, he was really big on medicine and, and just—I um, don't know. I think that would be pretty cool. Definitely. I don't know. But Definitely. That's probably him. Definitely. Definitely. Rusty wants to know what's at the end of the mouse trap: seeds or local weed sales? We'll be doing both. We'll have clones available in, in Thailand. We'll have um, we'll have beans available eventually uh, for for the you know various markets, and we'll have uh, um, you know flour available for dispensaries here in Thailand. And then we we'll, we we'll have our own dispensary too. But um, you know we'll have it available if you're in Bangkok or Pattaya. Or we'll have a couple of distribution points where we can we'll be doing regular deliveries too. So. Man, that's awesome! Definitely. So, you know, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I know it's probably getting pretty late there. Um, yeah, and, fine. Uh, I, could, I, could do it. I could do at least another half hour before. I'm, okay. All right. Know. I just didn't want, I didn't want to take up too much of your evening here.
but definitely, you know. So in Thailand, is Thai sticks still a popular thing over there? <laughs> I have yet to see it, and I've been to a lot of the weed things. Um, definitely. It's, I don't know. It's. I think it's more of an American invention than it is anything else. So you, don't, right. you don't see it tied up. Now, brickweed and stuff like that, like, do I have some up here? Oh, man. Brickweed. <laughs> oh, Hold shit. On. I haven't Somewhere seen one of those here. in years. <laughs> Somewhere here I have some brick. Oh, maybe it's not here anymore. Somewhere in this room there is some brickweed that I got at the shop the other day. Wow. Where is it? I got my bomb and I gave you a free thing of brickweed. Holy shit. Right. <laughs> that's, like that's impressive though. This you know, you don't see that no more. <laughs> Definitely. You can buy a you can buy a kilo of brick, which is crazy, but it's like fresh stuff. It's like fermented kind of. It has like a weird like cured fermented smell to it. It's not uh, I don't know, man. It's not it's not good most of the time. And then I've tried. I tried to get a couple of them because usually it's Cambodian or Lao. It's not usually Thai. Um, yep. And I just need to try and get the genetics from those. But yep. I, I was ever thinking popped, that. I think they're drying. In, I think they're drying in the heat on the rocks or something like that, like the Jamaicans did in the beginning. Wow. Yeah, that's definitely cool. I mean, you know that that would be the purpose why I'd, I'd buy something like that too. I'd be like, man, I hope I find a a seed in here that I can do something with you know definitely but man you don't see them bricks uh, over here so just you know when you hear of how they do things over there it a lot of things are similar but there's still a lot of differences and some of the stuff is still seems to be a little bit farther behind us i would say well most of, i mean your dispensaries and most of your people selling flour or selling good quality stuff or at least decent stuff um, but yeah. there, you know, you can still find the super, you know, you want to buy, uh, a thing for like 50 baht or 25 baht a, a gram. Like it's going to be that bricked out, you know, bottom of the barrel stuff. So I, I don't know conversion, but what would an ounce your guys's cost be in us dollars oh, at retail at retail? Yeah. Just out of curiosity. Um, so. We'll use like a conservative price. So we'll use 450 sure. watt a gram, which is a little bit lower than. Oh, we lost them. Uh oh. One yeah. second. I got you back. We... Right. There, there we, we go. go. <laughs> so we'll use 450 watt a gram. Most stuff is selling for 550 or better. So we'll use okay. 450 to be conservative. Um, and then we'll say 28 grams. So you're looking at 12,600 baht an ounce. Oh, um, divide oh. that by the exchange rate, which was 33 last time I went to the bank. So you're looking at $381 US equivalent. Wow. Wow. Yeah, the market is definitely strong over there. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Definitely. Man. You so know, you're looking at like... Thirteen and a half, you know, fourteen dollars a gram or more. Wow. Yep. So it's sad over here, I, I, at least on our commercial side of the market. I mean, because you know, I, I literally can drive up the road, and there's a dispensary now, and it's thirty-five dollars for an ounce. It's not good stuff, but to to know that, it, it, man, that's crazy. Just the wide, the wideness of the market is insane. Yeah, you're not going to get quality from that. That's you. What's interesting? No in way. Is, um, edibles and hash are still restricted to only the medical facilities. So um, huh? it'd be interesting to kind of see when they finally uh, finally relax on that. I do apologize. My internet connection is being a bit patty right now. I don't hey, know. man, you're talking from a long ways away. It's an honor and a great opportunity. Is I'm just happy that the audio is clear, man. It's great. We're hearing these stories. You know, you you're a man who's got to travel the world because of this plant, and 
to hear the stories and the stuff you've gone through already, man, I can only dream, you know, I haven't even been out of the United States, even in the, and I live in Michigan and Canada's right there. And I haven't even been there yet. And it's like, you know, it, it's an, it's amazing that you're out there. You're basically spreading the message around the world to normalize it. And, you know, to basically, that it's accepted and you're showing that it's accepted in all these places around the world. So like, like Rusty said, we need to normalize it. We need to just decriminalize it worldwide. I mean, because you can already see that it's being used in all these other places. It, it's, it's, it's foolish not to. So, uh I thought about your question earlier. I'm gonna I'm gonna retract my Genghis Khan and okay. replace him with Alexander Shulgin. Okay. I think Alexander Shulgin would be a much better person to smoke with. <laughs> uh, hey, you're the first on both of those. We get a lot of Bob Marley, Snoop Dogg, you know, Muhammad Ali. Do you know, uh, do you know Alexander Shulgin is? I don't, to be honest. I will be completely honest with you. <laughs> sure. so Alexander Shulgin um, was a, a famous, incredibly famous chemist, um, and he invented a, a whole slew of um, different psychedelics, more than any other single human being, like over 125. Wow. Uh, and, uh, and mapped them all out, DM, all the different forms of DMT and um, all your different tryptamines groups and all your different um, phenethylamines. Um, so, Definitely. yeah, there's, uh, there's a great, great books that he wrote as well. Uh, P call and T call, uh, phenethylamines I know and love, and um, uh, tryptamines I know and love. Wow. Definitely. I'll have to check them out. Definitely. You know, I, I, I'm always interested in absorbing any type of education I can get. You know, we were, me and uh, Red Setter Farms and Skillbo, they're from a couple other shows called Behind the Veil or something to do with the veil. I'm bad with names, but um, I, I check his show out each week and uh, they were just talking about, you know, um, DMT and all that stuff and how, how the FDA is actually looking at it for a form of medication now. And I was like, wow, that's impressive. You know, definitely. Speaking of which, uh, so uh, peyote is a common house plant here in Thailand. So you'll see people that have like 40, 50, 60 plants just in their window in the front of their house. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> like variegated ones and fancy ones and crested ones. And you're just like, people will lose their minds for these in the U.S. And, and oh, in definitely. fact, there's a farm. There's a farm that we visited the other day, and I, I, my phone was dead. I need to go back and, and film with a, a full battery. But uh, they had like four million peyote buttons uh, across this greenhouse or something insane like that. And I was just like, this is like heaven of multiple friends of mine. Like, I need to get this on film. Definitely. Uh, there's a really cool the, – the kids have been hanging out with lately down here, they have a, a big kratom forest that they've planted. They have about – I don't know, 100 kratom trees with cannabis growing in between, and it's pretty dope. That would be definitely cool. I seen the fish you caught, you know, and I was looking at that, and I was like, the one recently, and uh, I'm looking at it, and I'm like, man, that thing looks like a silver dollar fish that my parents had in our aquarium when I was a kid. I'm like, it looks so weird. Like, the body was big, and then it sloped down to, like, this little head, and I was like, man, that is weird looking. That was a clown knife. That's one of the fish in our aquaponics pond. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. Definitely. Man, that thing was massive. <laughs> oh, yeah. Do, and, do uh, people... We have the... go Sorry, ahead. go ahead. I was just going to ask if people ate them. Like, I, I didn't know if oh, it yeah. was a... Wow, okay. Yeah. yeah. They have uh, cat, them, catfish, and snakeheads are like the big... And tilapia are the big, like staple fish here and then you can find eels and the, there's like a perch like a climbing asian climbing perch uh, that they get a lot uh, but those those clown knives which is the one that i caught uh, are uh they can get quite a bit bigger than the one that i caught but uh that one was certainly more than edible size 
man, that's that's insane. I've ate tilapia, but I haven't ate any of the other ones. I, I I was gonna try eel once, and I'm not a sushi seafood guy. I'll, I'll be honest, and uh, I was kind of like turned my nose up at it, and was like, no, I'm good. I'll pass. Thank you though. But I've tried a lot of weird foods in my day. You know, I've ate alligator, I've ate possum, I've ate squirrel, I've ate some of the normalized things for here, but not a lot of seafood. I'm not a seafood guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah they have uh these little freshwater crabs that are everywhere here so that those are pretty normal to to get at the market or freshwater clams that's another one that's that's real common here because there's like um they live in the rice patties and stuff so people just collect them out of the rice patties definitely now rice wouldn't be bad i can eat that all the time and that's how you say skinny right <laughs> i mean right. you look at you look at a lot of the people over there that, there probably isn't a lot of obesity, is there? No. The other thing, too, I mean, you go out there and you work in the heat here, you're not going to yep. be fat very long. Uh, <laughs> right. Sweat it off. I mean, I know I lose like five pounds every every day. I'm, I'm out there in the in the full heat. Man, definitely. Although we try to avoid the midday. You know, ten right. to ten to two is not not too pleasant out there. So. Yeah. Try to get everything right. done in the morning, in the evening, or at nighttime. Like right now, uh, it's. 10 45 here at night but i was just out there working on cutting clones because it's wow you, know, you can't cut them in the middle of the day it's too hot of the clones yep. don't survive. what's the temperature like right now if you don't mind me asking during the day it's about 90 92 and then, um in the nighttime it goes down into the 50s uh, that's but in the summertime yeah. not summertime but during the, the dry or uh, wet season it gets much it'll get up to you know upper 90s and uh even even low 100s now and then so man and i, and I think i'm looking at the window right now it's 23 degrees and i got about a half a foot of snow on the ground <laughs> it's like 23 degrees celsius here <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> no fun i'm not good with conversion tables i'll be honest with you you know i get people from <laughs> Canada, I've talked to people from Barcelona and stuff like that. And it's like that a lot of the world still uses Celsius. Well, we're over here in Fahrenheit. And when you say 23 degrees Celsius, and I'm thinking, oh, it's cold. No, it's not half bad there. And I can't convert it, you know. And then when they they say, Well, what are you? And I say, I'm like 20 degrees. And they say, Well, that's negative over here. And I'm like, oh well, it's a big difference, you know. And I Unfortunately, I didn't study that in school. I wasn't too interested. Do you, know, do you know the reason why the metric system wasn't adopted in the United States? I don't. So they originally were going to adopt it. Like the government was like, cool, like totally. Um, and they made a new standard. Now a standard is a thing that you test against to calibrate your machines. So they had sure. the one kilo standard and then the one meter, one meter standard and like whatever the one centimeter standard, all the different ones that they had to send over to the government officials for the weights and measurements or whatever else for the official government, you know, registration of the other movements. Definitely. As this is back in like the 1800s, right? As the ship was coming across from Europe, a bunch of pirates hijacked the ship, took everything off of it and didn't realize what they had or whatever. Anyways, they ended up getting sunk um, by, I forget it was the American or British Navy, the pirate ship did, and they lost all of the original standards that were supposed to do it. And after that, they like never got around to sending new ones. Wow, that's crazy. Hey, you just educated me on something I didn't know, you know, definitely, you know, I was a history nerd, but at the same time, I didn't pay attention to a lot of the mathematical side of things when it came to like conversion tables and why is this like that? I was more interested in just getting done with the education, but now it's totally the opposite. I'm trying to get as much as I can take. Oh, we lost your camera, but I, oh, there we go. But yeah, definitely, you know, so it's it, we've been on here about 45 minutes i don't want to run you longer than an hour here you know with that being said because i i got to get to work today i work seven days a week unfortunately but um i uh is there anything you want the audience to know that with your company with you where they can find you where they can connect with you maybe where 
Eventually we can get some of them genetics over on this side of the pond um, and try some of your beans. Um, you know, what, what uh, I guess just kind of wrap it up for us here and let us know where we can find you at. Sure. So you can find me at potentponics.com. We have all kinds of links to the, the conference that I put on as well as Open Nutrient Project uh, and a bunch of other resources on there for, for you if you're growing at home and you want to learn what the nutrients are in your, your different composts and stuff. We have a ton of cool resources for that. Yeah. And then I uh, have the Growing With Fishes podcast every Thursday uh, at uh, 6.30 p.m. Pacific um, until you guys do the time shift again, then it'll be back to 7.30 okay but uh, thailand doesn't change so i have a set time that i have to film it <laughs> just like so yeah uh, i get stuck yep. with that but um uh other than that it's every thursday so you can find that on ponics youtube channel and soundcloud itunes spotify all the things um we also have a new show on wednesdays called that um that smoke show where we just hang out and have fun and you know it, it's a bunch of different podcasters and cannabis industry experts and stuff like that 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 do this at a, at a big scale and uh, it's always fun to talk to them and uh, it's a little more looser um, less formatted show than uh, than growing with fishes is so Definitely. check those out so I'll, I'll get them links from you after the show here and i'll put them in the description below and that way everybody can connect with you and find you and we look forward to seeing what you have coming in the future we'll have you on again and see how things are going for you once you get fully up and running you know to the to where you have everything smoothly going there you know i i heard you got some construction going so once you get past all that you know maybe we can have you back on and see how things are going for you yeah and maybe next time we'll we'll do an evening on your time so that we can film uh when the daylight's on uh, up here so that would be awesome. Definitely. I look forward to that. So with that being said, we appreciate you coming on the Organically Blunt Show. You have a great evening and we'll look forward to hearing from you soon. Have a great day. Thanks for having me on. You've been listening to the Organically Blunt Show, a cannabis lifestyle podcast that's raw, uncut, and unedited. Thanks for listening to the show. We would like to give thanks to this episode's partners. Grow Strong Industries, the mother brand of Gorilla Grow Tint, Kind LED, and Lotus Nutrients. Use coupon code Organically Blunt. Seedsman Seeds, a trusted seed bank with over 20 years in the industry. Use coupon code Organically Blunt. 10. Horticulture Lighting Group, HLG, Real Efficiency, Real Yields, and Made in the USA. Use coupon code Organically Blunt. Rain Science Grow Bags, one of a kind mesh grow bags that eliminate problems and increase yields. Use coupon code Organically Blunt. Grove Bags, the best curing solution to save terps. Use coupon code Organically Blunt. Captain Redbeard Seeds, genetics that are loyal to the soil. Use coupon code Organically Blunt. Humboldt Seed Company, Humboldt's original seed. Use coupon code Organically Blunt. Fish Head Farms, the maker of fish shit, the most robust beneficial bacteria on the market. Use coupon code Organically Blunt. Sofim Genetics, quality genetics at a fair price. Use coupon code Organically Blunt. Green Wolf Genetics. These genetics come from a wolf pack that runs with quality and no BS. Use coupon code Organically Blunt. Utopic Essential Nutrients. Discover the truth. Use coupon code Organically Blunt. Stream Gardening. World leading mycorrhizal fungi. Dry tents because we all need a place to dry that harvest. Use coupon code Organically Blunt. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to comment, like, and subscribe. And in the meantime, follow us on Instagram at Organically Blunt or on Social Club at Organically Blunt. You can reach us also via email at organicallyblunt at gmail.com. Organically Blunt can be found where you listen to podcasts such as iHeartRadio, Spotify, YouTube, Stitcher, Anchor.fm, and Apple Podcasts. See you next time on the Organically Blunt Show.